I pray that you're well on today. This is Pastor Hag with the First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you on this morning. Uh, this is our Sunday school lesson. Forgive me for not having the title put up yet. I will do that later. Uh, we just had to make sure we got rolling on our live feed on today. Pray that you're well. Uh, we're going to go through our Sunday school lesson on today, which is called Lest We Forget. Lest We Forget. And the printed text is coming out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. But before we get started, we'll have a word of prayer before we get started into the Sunday school lesson. I am here in the sanctuary, so for those who are uh, coming in and want to come into the sanctuary, you can um, uh, during this time. But of course, I'm going to make sure I try to keep honor to what we're trying to do with regards to our Sunday school lesson. So uh, we will have 10 o'clock worship on today here in the sanctuary and also virtually, so please join us during that time. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started on today. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day and thank you, God, for having us in this space, Lord, to go over your word. Thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do and how you bless us and keep us in every way. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you will meet us in this place, meet us in this space virtually as well as in person, and allow us, God, to see your glory as we move forward in the midst of this lesson on, on today. We love you and praise you in all things. God bless us now and keep us as we, Lord, are so humble to your word, humble to your way, and meet us in the auspices of this space, which is truly holy ground, Lord. We cannot begin without seeking your presence. We love you and praise you, Lord, for all that you continue to do. Bless us now and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, the title of our lesson this morning is called Lest We Forget. And our aim for change reads this way. Again, we're coming out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And the aim for change reads this way. It says, by the end of this lesson, we will understand what humility is in light of God's commandments. Appreciate God's blessings and our need for humility before the Lord and practice living a life of humility. And so our in focus reads this way. After high school, Jimmy became a licensed barber. Uh, to gain experience, he worked at a few shops at each, but each time it left a negative taste in his spirit. High booth rents, impersonal, excuse me, unprofessional management teams, and lack of respect from other barbers made him, made him uh, fed up with the industry. He decided to take a break. Every week, the customers he had gained over the years would hit him up to see when they could come to get a cut. Eventually, he gave in and slowly started back cutting hair. Soon, every weekend, Jimmy was booked up cutting hair in his basement. Uh, he fell back in love with cutting hair. Not only was he cutting hair, but also he was able to help his customers and give them advice whenever they needed it. That's what kept his customers coming back. Not many barbershops gave you a fresh cut and advice. <clears throat> Barbering was his ministry. Soon, weekends weren't enough to cut all of his customers. Finally, Jimmy decided to open his own barbershop. He knew he wouldn't be able to to open up his shop without the support of his customers, family, and friends. He dedicated his grand opening to everyone who helped him throughout the years. I just want to thank all of you for supporting me throughout the years, Jimmy said. I've wanted to open my own shop since I was a teenager. Because of setbacks, I wasn't able to make it a reality until today. I fell out of love with cutting hair, and if it wasn't for you all supporting me, I wouldn't be here right now. So this is for you all. And the question here says, whose prayers and support help you get to the place you are right now? How, has, how have you thanked them for everything they've done? And so everyone has to speak personally from that perspective of that question. I love this in focus because what it begins to do and show for us is a large part of my experience, my personal experience, came through barbershop. How, how I even learned the Bible came through the aspect of barbershop. Um, 
uh, Mr. Dave Harris. Uh, uh, he's gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, he was the head deacon of my uh, home church, Sunday Home Baptist Church in Eden, North Carolina. And he was a local barber. Not only was he a local barber, but he, he, he gave many people advice. Um, because he was just well-respected, well-respected man. Um, he literally owned his own barbershop, and he lived literally two blocks away from his barbershop. So if he wanted to walk to work, he could. Most of the time he drove, uh, he drove to uh, the barbershop, and he would be there cutting hair. He was the only barber there. But one of the things I realized over the years uh, through those experiences is that God has a way of setting you up with individuals and people around you that see the light of God in you and are, are willing to help you as long as what you're doing is authentic and it's real and it's genuine. And when that happens, I honestly believe that there are individuals who are like-minded just like you and me with regards to the auspices of God to his power, to his greatness, to Jesus Christ, and him being Lord of all, that the connections begin that folks will begin to support you in some way, shape, fashion, or form. It could be money. It could be just prayers. It could be other added support. But what we find is, is that it becomes a supporting theme with regards to how we connect each other, one with another, by way of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so... One of the things that we begin to understand is that that connectedness begins a cycle process. Even with Jimmy in this story, what we find is, is that Jimmy had a passion for cutting hair. But when he began to get through the minutia and the business and uh, some of the things that really weren't tied to authentic barbering, if you will, he began to lose passion for it. And I think that we can easily get caught up in the monotony of the fluff, if you will. All the superfluous things and superficial things that would tear us away from our first love. And we have to be very, very careful in regards to that because we have to always go back to why we were, in, why we were called into that space and into that place. And the love and the genuineness that we have for it. Uh, at the at the very beginning, because we can get caught up even in church. I, I've said this many times that um, when you begin uh, in ministry, there's a certain um, novice, if you will, if that's a word, being a novice, the beginnings of it, that you end up, uh, you don't see some of the polity, if you will, that sometimes does not relate directly to the word of God, nor has any element of the word of God in it. And I think that we have to come back to a place of reckoning in our spirit that the authenticity, again, and the genuineness and the realness of what God has called us to, that must be the premise and the foundation upon which we do the things that we do. It can't be the money. It can't be all the other things that come with it. It has to be the foundational elements of genuineness and authenticity that have encircled this very thing that keeps us coming back to doing what we're doing because we're in love with it. And I believe that when we do that, uh, God just honors that. I'll be honest with you, even in preaching, there are places where you get weary, where you get uh, tired, uh, and so forth. But I tell you right now, with regards to this pandemic and everything else that has gone on, I have been weary, I have been tired. A lot of things have happened, a lot of things have, have, have transpired in the midst of all this. However, one of the things I'm trying to do more and more of is that you can easily be discouraged with all the monotony and forget about the first love of why God brought you into that space. Why God brought you into that place of being able to teach and preach the word of God. And so with that being said, this is why I think we have to have this unction of that. And as we have people coming in uh, and so forth, I'm not going to point folks out, but uh, folks coming in um, in regards to our lesson here in the sanctuary. One of the things that we have to come to grips with and grips with is this, this place of us not forgetting the foundations, not forgetting where we came from, not forgetting why we fell in love with Jesus Christ in the first place, why we fell in love with the ministry of the calling that he's placed us in, because that is going to be the fuel, especially in dark days, especially in dark times. That is where the fuel is going to come in in order to keep us going 
in the midst of all of this. I'm going to be honest with you. There, there are many pastors, unfortunately, that are just tired and are ready to give up. If you saw the statistics on preachers who just resign from their positions as pastors, you'll be surprised because so many people get to the point where there's so much fatigue and being tired that they forget the aspect of the first love and they're like, is this even worth it? Is it even worth doing this for uh, the people of God, for those that are coming, you know, coming on a regular basis and so forth because of maybe the drain and getting caught in the administrative monotony of things and so forth. But this is why you have to take a seat back and be able to really go back to God and really ask God, one, for strength, two, for discernment. Because when you begin to have that, it becomes a connection point for all of us to begin that process, to begin uh, going back to why we fell in love with Christ in the first place and the longevity of what we're doing. I believe that even my own uh, barber back in, back in the day in Eden, North Carolina, I believe that's why he gave so much of his time because he made it a point to always go back to the root of what he fell in love with in the first place. And that was Christ. So regardless of what he did, he used being a barber as a tie-in for ministry. And I, I think I've told some folks before that most of, a lot of my Bible learning came from him and spending time in his barbershop after hours, after five o'clock, after he was done cutting hair. We would spend time studying the Bible. And, and, and this is something that he would give him his time. He didn't have to do it, but he would give him his time in order to do it. And, and it actually helped me. So you, you, know, you don't know how many people that you're pouring into by that first love of your calling. Okay, whether that's teaching, preaching, whether that is uh, ministering in some way in the church, whether it's something on your job or or maybe at the recreation center, the YMCA that you go to. It, it's, it's something that builds the aspect of character. Okay, you're building someone else up without even knowing it. And, and people are coming to you because they see something in you that is real and it's very authentic and it gives them motivation and encouragement to push forward. And that should be a blessing to you as well and give you fuel for the fire as you continue to journey through this life and continue to motivate others through the ministry God has called you to. So with that being said, I'm going to get into our Keep in Mind scripture on today, which is Deuteronomy 8 and 11. Deuteronomy 8 and 11. Um, let's go here. New Living Translation. This is what it reads. It says, but that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. Let me read that again. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 11. So before we get started, uh, let's go into some background here to kind of set up um, this aspect of scripture on today. And I'm going to be reading right from our commentary book. Again, I like to give propers to uh, the individuals who write the precepts for living. You see this here in front of you. This is our Sunday school manual. This is what we use here at First Mount Zion through the Urban Ministries Institute. I want to make sure people see this in case they want it for themselves or so forth, they can go and order through Urban Ministries Institute. Look it up on the website. You'll be able to find it. But this is what we use here at First Mount Zion. It's definitely relevant to the context of Christian education that we have here at our church. So with that, the wilderness wandering. It reads this. When the Israelites left Egypt, there were more than 600,000 men, women, and children in the caravan. There was no way that the meager resources of the Sinai Desert could support a multitude of that number. So the people were completely dependent on God for their survival. God caused a sweet bread called manna to rain down from heaven to sustain them. Exodus 16, 4, 30, uh, 4 and 31. When the people grew, drew, uh, grew tired of the heavenly bread, God fed them with quail. Uh, verses 13 and 14. When the people ran out of water, he miraculously provided them with water. Exodus 17, 6, Numbers 20 and 11. Ever since crossing the Red Sea, the people were quarrelsome and discontented. In spite of all that, God had, in spite of all, 
in spite of all that God had done for them, they could not find it in their hearts to trust him. Whenever adversity struck, the people would complain rather than pray. God allowed the Israelites many different opportunities to trust him when faced with hardship, but each time they failed. Here's our background. Deuteronomy is the second telling of God's law to Moses and the children of Israel. The people of Israel are about to enter the promised land after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years as a result of their disobedience. A new generation of Israelites is present to hear the law who are to hear the law who do not remember being delivered from slavery in Egypt or being called to worship God. Many of the people present do not remember being disobedient to the Lord and committing idolatry when they received the covenant. Yet they have had their own experiences with temptation and sin as well as witnessing God's deliverance and provision. Moses is retelling the law and reminding the Israelites of the covenant to encourage them to keep God's commands and prepare them to begin their new lives in the promised land with the Lord. The Israelites humble themselves and follow God's law. They will prosper in the land God is giving, giving them. And the question here says, how can we pass down lessons we have learned to the generations that come after us? And so with that, I really don't want to put him on the spot, but since he's here, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, uh, Deacon Kenny, Kenny Floyd. Uh, I, I want, if you don't mind, you come, just come a little closer so folks can, folks can hear you. You don't have to see you, then we'll make sure they can hear you. Uh, but I want to kind of get your insights to this question of, again, how can we pass down the lessons we have learned to the generations that come after us? And so uh, this lets you all know, I'm not going to put him on camera, but uh, Deacon Kenny Floyd, he's our superintendent of Sunday schools. And as we come back into our building, we're beginning the process of trying to figure out the class structure and so forth. Because after Easter, uh, that will be the 24th, April 24th, we're going back to classroom instruction. We will have uh, Sunday school virtually. We're going to have to figure that out. The pastor probably will have to do that uh, in order to be able to show the teaching lesson or we'll either pay into other classes and do it that way. But we want to still have it virtually so you can get that Sunday school lesson each and every week on, on Facebook Live as you watch us live. So again, uh, Deacon Kenny, how can we pass down lessons we have learned to the generations that come after us? Well, I believe uh, <clears throat> the, the first thing we have to not forget where we come from, and we should always teach and remember our history. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that's big. You know, we need, we need to teach our history along with, you know, the other aspects of the Bible, you know, as we go along. Never forget our history. Okay. That, that's what I strongly believe. Okay, so not, not, forgetting our, not forgetting our history, not forgetting where we come from. And and why and why why is that just so why is it so important you know even for you personally why why is it so important for you and your family for your wife and kids and your grandkids and so forth why why do we hold on so tight towards that just you know just for you know for me the identification knowing who we are knowing our background knowing uh, truthfully I say who we are mm -hmm. because. Uh, uh, history has been, uh, I say, held back, mm -hmm. distorted. Our history, black mm -hmm. history, has been held back and distorted. <clears throat> we've been not, we've not been, you know, taught the truth. Ah, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, mm -hmm. the things we learned in school, you know, I, I realize now they weren't the whole truth. You know? uh -huh. And uh, you know, black history is black history, and their history is their history. You know, coming up, I remember we, we learned more of their history than our history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm now I'm so adamant about, you know, what's my history? Right. You know, right. What about my people? You know. Yeah. And, and, I'll, I, and I'll tell you, Deacon Ken, one of the things that we see in this, and, and this is why I'm so big on the whole critical race theory piece. And, you know, what, what we see in society now saying we need to take certain books out of school and things of that nature. Well, my thing is, what is the purpose of education? The purpose of education is not only to learn, but it's also to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think we can't be challenged if we don't see the frailties and errors, the wrongs of the past. Right. And you can't see that when certain history is left out. Mm -hmm. And see, I think some people get to this point where they get to this place of self-glory and say, well, it's nothing we did wrong. Mm -hmm. 
You know, that's nothing we did. You know, in regards in regards to the history. Well, no, all of us have done something. So, I mean, if you're a Christian, you should definitely understand Romans 3.23. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's no level of perfection that you can try to exhibit or display to try to say that this is, uh, that, you, that, that, that this particular people or race or group live, you know, just live flawlessly. That's a lot, right. you know, in and of itself. And I think that when we look at it biblically, the Bible challenges us from the perspective of don't forget not only the Lord your God, but also don't forget all the wrong you did. Don't forget all the things that you got wrong. Because at the end of the day, that's a lesson too. And I think when we begin to understand that, what we find is when we don't forget those things, we become better. Even though it might initially hurt and say, you know what? You know, slavery was really bad. You know, slavery was, was not great. Jim Crow was not great at all. And so forth. So there's a lesson there. So if, if there's a lesson, that even this thing going on in Ukraine, you know, there's a lesson that's there from history that we can go back and say, wait a minute, this looks very Hitlerish, if you will. This looks like Adolf Hitler all over again. So did we not learn something from the atrocities and all those Jews that were killed during the Holocaust? Did we not learn anything from all that when uh, Germany was trying to take over all these nations and ultimately the world when we see what's going on in Russia right now? So, so there, again, there are lessons even in life, also biblically, that I believe that we can link, glean from to make us better. Because when we get that stuff, we're, we're, we're condemned to repeat it. We're, we're condemned and doomed to repeat it all over again and it just becomes a cycle. So why not put it out in the open? Why not put it in the air? You know, when, when, when you have someone who writes a, a 1619 project, you know, on, on slavery, you know, in critical race theory, and then is pretty much banished by the flagship university of the state, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. That should say something to the, the, the psyche and the mindset of certain individuals that don't want certain things to be shown. And I think when you begin to shun that, what you're doing is you're shutting a major part of culture away. This is one of the reasons, y'all, why I went through and went through this whole Ancestry.com thing with myself. Because I wanted to know what was the truth. People telling me I got Indian, uh, black Cherokee Indian in my family and so forth. And I'm finding out that that's not true and so forth. But I'm like, that, 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 it doesn't make sense. So what is the truth? Because the truth, truth will set you free and it will give you an insight into who you actually are. My makeup is 80% African continent. That's Nigeria, Congo, Mali, Benin, a whole bunch of other countries. And the Bantu people region, basically, of the Congo and Zaire. Then, I got 20% of my makeup that comes out of uh, Ireland, Sweden, Germany, and um, mostly in, 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 your, in, uh, in, in Great Britain, in Wales. That's the other 20% of my makeup. Okay? Why? That's a product of slavery. That's the reality. That's a product of slavery. So, so the reality becomes, let's know what that is. And how do we become better after we've known it? After we know what that truth is. Okay? This is good stuff. This is good stuff. I'm going to get into our scripture reading on today. And we're going to dig into our text. <clears throat> dig into our text. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. We'll make sure that's right. Yes. 1 through 11. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And this is what it says. It says, be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. How did it, uh, how did it, he, excuse me, he did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, 
The Lord your God dis disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and hearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a land of flowing streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron, iron is as common as stone and copper is as abundant in the hills, is, is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your field, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. And so as we enter this lesson on today, um, really verses, start with verses one and two. I'm going to read the commentator right now and we'll kind of get into some discussion about it. Uh, a promise kept, okay? God's promise is kept. Deuteronomy 8, 1 and 2. Moses is relaying the responsibilities of the covenant the Lord made with the children of Israel on Mount Horeb, okay? Mount Horeb is the same place as Mount Sinai, okay? So if you ever hear Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, it's the same place. Before they enter into the promised land, the Lord told the children of Israel that they were to keep his commandments, including the Ten Commandments and many others found in Exodus and repeated in Deuteronomy. If the Israelites keep the commandments, then they will multiply and prosper in the promised land as a result of God's glorious presence. Moses also notes that God is keeping his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by delivering the people into the promised land and allowing them to multiply and prosper there. But as a result of God's sovereign knowledge and the Israelites' disobedience when they received the covenant, the Lord tested them in the wilderness. They were shown the power and provision of God, as well as the result of their disobedience for 40 years as they wandered. And the question here says, why do you think it is important that Moses reminds the Israelites about the promises God made to them and their ancestors? And their ancestors? Woo. First of all, let me, I'm going to work this from the, from the end to the beginning. Okay? Back in that question says, um, again, that God made to them and their ancestors. Now, I want you to understand something, that there's something historical in what that question says. It says that God didn't stop with just one group. That God made it clear for the entire family and the generations to come. So what this says is, is that God's promises still remain true even now. Okay, so so what grandmother taught you about God, what, what, what your mom and dad may have told you about God, what great grandma or, or, or your nana told you about uh, in regards to God, that all of that was preconceived knowledge that was passed down to them. Okay, from somewhere. It could have came from the barber. You just never know. So because of that, those promises are consistent regardless of time. And this is important because God doesn't change, okay? Let's, let's get that clear. Whatever God has said, that's what it is. And because of that, God wants to make it clear that his, his, his truth continues to be consistent throughout time. So regardless if it's the time of, of 1847 uh, to 2022, that God has never changed. God is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. And so because of that, that becomes now the staple upon which we live and we pass down throughout time, okay? Pass down the statutes of God, the obedience towards God. What God has said is right. What God has said is wrong. What God has said is the way he wants us to live by way of his righteousness. And this is so important because what it does is it also shows all the promises that God has kept throughout the years. How God has kept us when he said that if we accept the salvation, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse, cleanse us from all, unright all unrighteousness. He has made it clear that his word is 
consistent. And that question again brings the importance of the reminding that Moses does in Deuteronomy to these effects, to the effect of God being who he is, to the effect of God being who uh, he says he's going to be, okay? And maybe in another time, in another different aspect of time, but it's consistent with what God has said. And so with that, I, I, I want to ask um, folks that are here, um, folks that are here, again, when you read, we hear that question, what do you think, why do you think it is important that Moses reminds the Israelites about the promises God made to them and their ancestors? I don't know if you had anything, Deacon Kenny, in regards to that. Well, <clears throat> it goes back to what, I alluded to what I said earlier, you know, lest we forget, I forget uh, that saying, but we always have to remember because if we don't, we'll fall for anything that's say taught to us mm -hmm. or told, told to us, you know. And I think that's where we got all with this slavery stuff, you know, we got all we lost our way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. once, you know, but you know, actually it happened before then, but you know, there's a thing that we have we have our own history. Never talk to us, you know, and uh, I think the time is now where information is so abundant. You know, there, there's a there's a, a, a time now that you know we are able to learn our history, mm -hmm. you know, and find out more and not forget our history because a lot of us, you know, we don't know who we are. Why do you think this is important for Moses? And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put it I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it out of the African American context. I'm gonna put it in the Israeli context, the Hebrew context, because I believe it, they, it still has the same rearing from that. But I want I want to hear from you. Why do you think Moses was really trying to stomp this in folks' heads to be able to say, "Look, you can't forget this. You can't forget the past. You can't forget these last forty years. You can't can't forget that God brought us out of Egyptian slavery." And I've always said the African American experience and the, and the Hebrew experience in the book of Exodus, almost one for one. Yeah. It's almost one for one. Moses had a responsibility. God gave him that assignment, you know, to lead his people out of Egypt. And uh, I think it was important for him to get the point across to the people. You know, remember this. Remember who you were before and remember how God brought you out and remember, you know, that he gave you manna and you know all those things uh, I think uh, Moses wanted he had the assignment and he wanted to get it he wanted to finish mm -hmm. you know because he knew he had a certain amount of time and uh, he wanted his people to be uh, I guess uh, fulfilled or he wanted them knowledgeable about you know what was going on and what God was doing for them? It, it's I, I see I see everything that you just said and it's just spot on, uh, Deacon Kenny. I, I, I would say say this, and, or maybe ask this question: Is how difficult is it for us to move forward, move forward, if we don't have an identity from the past? How how, how difficult is it for us to go forward? Because I look at Moses. There's no way the Israelites could have conquered, I think, it's seven nations. There's no way they could have conquered seven nations and moved across the Jordan the way they did unless they had some level of identity of who they were and who their God was. Mm -hmm. I believe the, uh, the miracles of God showed them who he was and showed them that they need, needed to depend on God, you know, for those things, for those uh, victories that they had. And God wanted his people to rely on him. And I believe Moses was showing the people that, you know, we need to rely on God, you know, to uh, make it across or to become free from, you know, the past. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's the same thing. Nothing has changed today. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we need to uh, realize who God is to us. Mm -hmm. You know, not just some... Uh, Miracle worker, but he's our father, mm -hmm. our father, you know, and uh, maybe, maybe that answered the question. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's all, those are all, found, those are foundational elements. And I honestly believe that you can't move to the next dimensions until you have a true sense of who you are. And that true sense comes by way of background of what God has done, the miracles he's done, how he has remained consistent, and also to reflect that every, every ounce of strength that you have in order to be able to go forward is by way of what God has already placed in you foundationally. And I believe that that becomes, that's how you cross your Jordans. That, that's how you cross your, your trials and tribulations is going through that because when you have a foundational understanding that, it becomes a staple for you. You, you also know the wrongs of the past and what you don't want to do again. And then you also are steered in a direction that says, if I have these facets in place and I ask God for the guidance, he's going to lead me and he's going to give me what I need. But I can't forget. I can't forget what God has done. You know, I can't, I can't forget anything that he's done for me. And I believe that begins for us to give us that power and that unction from the spirit in order to project, in order to move forward, in order to continue doing what we're doing, even in difficult times. Because I'm going to tell you, this pandemic, this thing has gone full circle for the last two years. And one of the things I've realized, not just here at First Mountain Zion, but I've seen it in other churches, even talking to other pastors, that folks are just in the place of just waning, their strength is down, that they're like, it's like more encouragement needs to be fueled in, and it's like, okay, from this point forward, what are we going to do? You know, what, what, how, how is this going to look as we go forward? And we have to remain content in what we're doing, but even when our strength is waning, to be able to pull back and say, God, I need you to fill my cup again, and I need you to overflow it because I can't do anything further without it because this is draining. This does drain. And there is a physical drain to stand, but there also has to be a reflection of how did folks get their strength back? How do you get their strength back in the midst of those trials and tribulations while still trusting God. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, there are lessons there. there are le and I believe this is a lesson that's tied, in, tied into that. Even, even in our own experiences, even as African Americans, we've seen it. We've seen it through our family members. We've seen it. And that should be fuel for us. It should be something that makes us press on and continue to go forward. This is good stuff, y'all. Um, if you're sitting in here, you know you would call it on. Just let you know. <laughs> um... <clears throat> Let's go, let's go to the other verses here, three through six. And it says, I'm going to read these verses. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now remember, this is the very scripture that Jesus used when he was tempted in the wilderness before he went to his public ministry. So there's power in the word of God. Verse 4. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and, fe and fearing him. Let me go into what the commentator writer says here. He says, Moses shares two examples of how the Lord miraculously provided for the children of Israel during their time in the wilderness. The Lord supplied manna when they were hungry and preserved their clothes and shoes for decades. This was done not only to test their character, but to show the character of God. Character of God. God is a provider, thank God, but also a parent to them. God will not leave them. But does, but does want them to demonstrate obedience and faithfulness to him. If they fear God, meaning they respect him, they will obey him. If they do not obey the Lord, they will face discipline through trials that are ultimately for their good and will develop them into the people of God they are called to be. How is God like a parent in our lives? How is God different from an earthly parent? Anybody want to deal with that? Is that he knows everything. 
and also a wealth of knowledge to pass on to our children to make it better. The beauty of the church, if you ask me, is that because we're a community of believers, we're all looking out for each other. That's what the church is about. It's us looking out for each other and truly doing that by way of love. So just like your, your children, Deacon Melissa, or your grandchildren, your family, again, Deacon Floyd, your family, your children, Again, Sister Anita, your children, your family, and so it's, it's, there's a connection piece. So in this, in the love of God, there's no conditionality. So everything is unconditional. So I want to see your baby succeed just like I want to see my baby succeed. I, if they want to go to trade school, what do you want to do? You want to be an automotive technician? You want to work on diesel engines? Look, let's find a way for you, to, for you to make that happen, okay? We might not, we may not do it ourselves, but I guarantee you, we know somebody at least to point in the direction and say, you know, you need to talk to this person. You need to talk to these individuals. Let's bring these folks in so you can get some knowledge around this if this is an interest of yours. And so what happens there becomes this connection that all of our love, to me, that's still all love. It all connects because we're giving one to another for the betterment of themselves as well as us. Because there should be a blessing that you receive by giving. There should be a blessing that you receive by way of giving. And when you do it, it should, it should free you. It should, it should be very free. It's like, you know what? I was able to help. I was able to help this person. I was able to help that person. And not that you're keeping a list or a record of it. It's the matter when you look at their life later on and you see what they're doing, you can say, you know what? God used me and maybe dropped these seeds in this place in order to give them encouragement so they can do something positive rather than doing something negative in life. Where, where, where they're off to college and becoming doctors and lawyers and trade school, doing whatever they're doing and not doing something that is completely against the will of God. So this becomes that tie-in. And when we see this, we see that God is providing along the way. So one of the things that, that happens is that as a parent, we're going to extend and give. But when you're in a community of like-minded believers, it becomes, that, it becomes the, that very thing again and again and again. We give to our children. We give to each other because we want to make sure that we're sharing with one another to show that love of God and show our concern, to show the genuineness of who we are, of who we are, and connect with each other that way. Because God is a God of plenty. God is not a God of deficit. And I honestly and truly believe, really, as a, as a pastor and as a Christian, that if there's something that God has on your heart to do, you can do it. You can do it. And there are people around you that want you to do it. They want you to do it and are going to help to try to plant something in you. It might be money. It may be just encouragement by word. But we're going to try to facilitate and push that so that what God has for you comes to fruition. That it comes to pass. And that's so important, I think, in our day and time, especially what we're living in right now. To continuously give that encouragement in order that we see people's lives transformed. 
And at the end of the day, we point and say, look what God did. Look what God has done. Because that's where it came from. He just used me as a vessel to help a little bit. He put a little bit in there. That's it. That's it. I wasn't so proprietor, but I poured a little bit of what God had given to me in the year. But it's all God. And that's the beauty of, of, of this. And we can't forget that. Can't forget that. Anybody else have anything on that question? Okay, let me go a little further before we run out of time. <laughs> um, verses 7 through 11. Let me read those. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a land, in a good land of flowing streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out in valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, of olive oil, and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful, and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone. The copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. And the commentator writer says this, Moses closes this portion of his address by describing the greatness of the promised land. The land God is giving the children of Israel is plentiful. For the people of Israel who are living in a world of farmers, shepherds, and traders, this land will be paradise. The soil is fertile. There is a natural fruit. There are abundant water sources. And there is mineral wealth for building and trading. God is given, giving this tiny, soon-to-be nation all the resources it needs to flourish. Moses warns that the response to this abundance should be humility and thanksgiving. If the Israelites inherit all these blessings and forget the Lord who gave it to them, they will face judgment. If they do not keep the commands, laws, decrees, and regulations of the Lord, they will not prosper as they are supposed to in the place of God's promise. And the question here says, how are the responsibilities the Lord gives the Israelites as they move from slavery to freedom, similar to the responsibilities of a Christian moving from sin to freedom? Let me read that question again. How are the responsibilities the Lord gives, to the, gives the Israelites as they move from slavery to freedom, Similar to the responsibilities of a Christian moving from sin to freedom. Anyone, anyone want to deal with that? Deal with that answer. How, how, are, how is it similar? Moses talking about moving from slavery to freedom, and then the Christian aspect of moving from sin to freedom. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start this off. <clears throat> so we know and look at Sin is being many things. One, we look at sin as death. We look at sin, at sin as confinement. We look at sin as restriction. We look at sin as, um, as not adhering to a guidance that will lead to prosperity. And I say prosperity, not materialism, but into spiritual prosperity. The reason why I say all this is because slavery in and of itself has a whole connotation of being locked up, okay? Now, we see slavery mentioned, of course, in the New Testament from the standpoint of being basically being a slave to Christ. And we can't look at it from the world's view of what slavery, slavery is. We can't make the synonymous piece to that because the connection comes in with the connection of how we view what freedom is and also why serving God is also unrestricted. Meaning that even though it has restrictions, it is for our freedom and provision so that we do not live a, a, uh, a life that is locked down. Most people think that well, if I have the you know, freedom to do whatever I want to do, then I can do whatever I want to do. But if you do that, you're actually positioning yourself to live in slavery. Because there's a level of confinement that you're going to place yourself in based off the freedom that you're defining. And it's not really God's freedom. Anybody, anybody else want to deal with that? I was thinking from bondage, bondage to freedom. You know, you know, bondage covers you know a lot. You know, 
And uh, it's not only seeing it, you know, but it's every day, you know, going from bondage to freedom, you know. Uh, and today, you know, like back then, they went, uh, uh, Israelites went from bondage to freedom when they left Egypt. Mm -hmm. And like we go, like today, you know, a lot of us live in bondage and not know it, you know, but we're kind of, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a word, satisfied within our bondage, mm -hmm. not knowing how to taste or get the freedom, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and God wants to show us, you know, if we go back and obey or repent, how to get out of bondage into freedom, you know, even, even within this world, you know, we can be free. You know, and uh, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it was something that you said when you said bondage. In my mind, being Kenny, I started thinking. I said, you know, this will be a good analogy. I look at baggage. Okay, if you ever fly and you and fly in the airport, the more bags that you check in, the more it's gonna cost you. And what's amazing is a lot of times we want to carry our own carry all this baggage that we think we need to have. However, containing that baggage is a lot of stuff that God said you don't need, and we try to carry it anyway, not realizing that we think that well, it's freedom to be having all this stuff. Well, not freedom necessarily to be having all that stuff. It actually can be a way down, and that could cost you more. <laughs> it can actually cost you more because you're carrying a whole bunch of stuff that God says you really don't need. So, so the reality becomes, I think, when you look at sin and freedom, is that when we look, even with the Israelites, and I'm speaking of a material aspect, but I believe it has spiritual connotation, when you think about it, they left with nothing. They left with the stuff that was on their back. And the Egyptians gave them all the stuff, okay? Money and all this other treasures, coins, and so forth. So they left with a surplus, not that they asked for it, but God said, you're gonna need, God knew you're going to need this stuff. You're going to need it, but I'm going to make them give it to you. Make them give it to you in order to leave. But what, all they had was the shirts on their back in order to go out on the journey. So that means there's a faith journey that you're going on. And, and think about this. As you're leaving slavery, that God has a way of making sure provisions are made so that you don't go hungry, to ensure that you have everything that you need, to ensure that in your spiritual awakening, that God has allowed for all these provisions to happen, not for you to store them and store them over it and, and hoard them, even with the manna from heaven. He told them, this will come to you daily. And on, and on the sixth day, you'll get twice as much because you're not going to work on the seventh to pick it up. So, so God has a way to know that along the journey that he set for you to set certain people, places, and resources in place to ensure that what he has for you at the end, that you'll get there. I don't know how many times I was broke at Morehouse. I was broke, I was broke consistently. And so I found, found a way where God, God maneuvered various things and moved certain people in my life that actually helped me, you know? That helped me, that, that gave me certain resources or gave me certain things. I might, I might not have enough money to wash clothes. And they said, oh, okay. You got washing bottles, you got all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I got all that, but I ain't got no money. <laughs> you know, wash my clothes. Oh, here's five dollars. Go, go wash your clothes. Well, and you'll never know who's there, who's there to help you along the journey. One of the blessings I, when I was in school was an individual by the name of John Steele. He owned a store that was right across from the library, from Woodruff Library in the Atlanta University Center. Now, one of the things that people don't know is that all the schools in the Atlanta University Center, that's Spelman, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta University, Morris Brown, all of us use the same library, only one library. And that's what people didn't really understand. Y'all don't have your own library? I said, no, the way the center is built, there's only one library, and it's big enough for all the schools. So when we were in the library, it was like being co -ed. So John Stegall was right across the street from the library. This, this is kind of a convenient store. It had picnic tables in it, which I'm still trying to figure out how you put those picnic tables in the store. He had, had a grill in the back. Don't you know, for three years, I ate for free in that store. And the only reason why I ate for free in the store 
the, the schools would not allow him to come on campus to pass out flyers for the freshmen that were coming in. So normally as a resident assistant, I would get there early, get there a week early, and I would just go to his store. He would have all the flyers there. He was like, these are all the ones for Morehouse, these are all the ones for Clark Atlanta, and so forth. And I went to Mr. Stegel and I said, how are you getting these to the schools? He was like, well, they won't let me on the school, the school, the schools. He said, but you know what? This is where you might come in. I said, would well, you need these passed out? He said, I need you to take these to all the freshmen doing. He said, all the upperclassmen know who I am. He said, but all the freshmen don't. And I said, okay, Mr. Steele. He said, now tell you what. Tell you what. He said, for the remainder of the year, he said, you can come in here once a day, order anything on the menu, free. Come here one, once a day, excuse me, once a day, and get anything on the menu, and it's free. He gave me a card. Everybody in the store knew what that card was. When I presented it, they, they didn't even question it. All they would do was ring it up, ring it up as, no, as, a, as a zero sale. They said, get your food. For three years, <laughs> I ate free. A lot of people didn't know that. But I thank God that I was able to help him. But he saw how enough foresight to see, you know what? These kids, don't, they're coming here just to get an education. They ain't got no money. He said, let me help, let me help at least a few of them from that perspective. And you never know who you have around you that's helping you or that can help you right here in this church. That can be a conduit and be of a help to someone who is saying, I want to do this or I want to do that. Even with the conversation we had with the kids last week, um, just a lot of things I gleaned from that uh, of things that hopefully in the near future that we'll be able to do and hopefully see them do just based off resources. You know, to be able to pull some people in to say, yeah, you can go to school. And so, I mean, it's, it's amazing to be able to see that and be able to do that. But again, we cannot forget what God has already done and what God is already doing, what he continues to do. That's what's going to fill us and keep us going for the future and beyond as we're a community of faith. I'm done teaching. I'm done for the day teaching. Any questions or comments in regards to what has been taught in this lesson? Again, for those online, you can, you can still watch this on Facebook, um, on Facebook Live, or on Facebook, or on YouTube once it gets posted there uh, on our YouTube channel, First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Again, on the end of this lesson, we're going to end this lesson today just with a word of prayer as we move into our worship time. Please join us probably around 10 or 15 or so. We'll be ready for worship, and you can join us online once again. Again, we we'll thank everyone who's here, and we're going to have a word of prayer at this time. Let us pray. Most eternal our lives, God and Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson on today that we don't forget, oh Lord, the greatness of who you are, the potential, endless potential of what you can do. Because God, you've done it so many times over where we're satisfied, God, because of what you've already done. Content, oh God, with what you give us because it leads us down the journey of life. Bless us now and keep us, oh Lord, and give us what we need on this journey of life. And continue, Lord, let us not forget, oh God, the great things which you have done for us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all. Amen. Again, I'm Pastor Hagel from First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and real people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Take care and join us around 1015 for our worship on today. God's blessings to you. Take care and be blessed.